No, Junior boy, you're stupid. No, Nani girl, you stupid. Nani girl, you stupid too. <laughs> See, mom said you stupid. Junior boy more stupid than me, mom. Both you guys is stupid. Oh, mom. Well, your hair looks stupid, mom. Oh, no, you didn't just talk about my hair, boy. Your father paid good bucks for this hair. Good bucks. Hey, you know what? Oh, you guys, shut up. If anybody's calling anybody stupid in here, it's me. You. You stupid and grounded. What the? Again. You cannot double ground me. You, oh. you stupid and grounded. Oh, dad. I what I did. And you, you stupid and your hair still look ugly after all the money I spent on you. You know what, Frankie? I didn't even know why we got married. All we do is fight, fight, fight. Yeah, that's all we do is fight. I don't even know why we married too. This is so stupid. This whole family is stupid. Yeah, dad. You an idiot. Junior boy, check up. What? Huh? What? Huh? What? Huh? What? Huh? What? It's the bigger love of the family. The fight. You know, we have different moments in our life where there's tension and, and, and really within us we have to make a decision. Who's going to win today? Wow. Anybody ever been in that place before? Where you've had to make that decision and say, it's either him or it's me. And I'm just determined I'm going to win. See, society has told us and actually has directed our fighting. I'll say that one more time. Society has become the director of our fight. They determine what's important. They determine what's valuable. They determine what you fight for and even how you fight. We use tools like manipulation. We use things like our mouth to speak forth certain things in fighting. And there's certain ways we fight. But I want to challenge you this morning to understand that there is a godly way to fight. I'll say that again. There's a godly way to fight. As we look at this passage here in Galatians chapter 5, it's very unique because Paul the Apostle is writing the church in Galatia and he's dealing with a certain situation that has become very problematic. There's something happening in the church where people are biting at each other and devouring each other and it's beginning to affect the entire culture of the church. The church is ceasing to be the church because there's all these things happening that are contaminating the true reality of how the church is supposed to function. So Paul feels like it's very important to deal with these things that have just gradually crept into the church and begin to defile, begin to begin to, to, to destroy and, and to create a new structure of functioning which is ungodly. So he uses these three words that I want us to take a look at. Let's take a look at the text this morning. First of all, he uses a word bite. Now, I just want to jump in real quickly to the Greek understanding. I'm not going to go too deep here, but I want us to get an in incredible revelation of really what Paul is trying to tell us. He says this, but if you bite and devour, now I want to talk about those two words just real quickly. Number one, bite means this, to bite with teeth. This is the original context, to bite with teeth, to wound the soul, cut, lacerate. This is what's interesting. This specific word gives connotations of a physical action intended to wound the soul of another. Wow. 
This word bite gives a connotation of a physical action intended to wound the soul of another. We don't realize the power, and I think a lot of us forget the power of our words, the power of shaming someone, the power of ignoring people. To give someone the cold shoulder. See, there's things that we do that we don't realize impact and affect people the way it does. We think, well, I'm just going to ignore that person because they're irritating me. But little do we know is we're actually doing a physical act that affects their soul. We don't understand that when you curse your kid out, it's a physical act that is wounding their soul. We don't understand that when we shame someone publicly, it's a physical act that is wounding their soul. It becomes something that that begins to destroy the constructs of their life. We don't understand this. And I think too often one of the problems within the household, one of the problems within the church is we don't understand the power of our actions and the power of our words. But Paul had to help the church understand that there are things that you are doing that are affecting the soul of people. You're tearing people down. You're wounding people. You're hurting people. That's not how the church is supposed to respond. That's not how the house and the family is supposed to act. It should be a place of safety. It should be a place of life. We speak life in this church. Can I get an amen? Amen. We speak life in our families. Can I get an amen? Amen. We don't call our family stupid. Yeah. You're so stupid. I love that. Because you know what? It's real. Look, I'm, I, I grew up in Hawaii. I grew up in this culture. I'm a part of this culture. And it's not just Hawaii. It's, it's this hodgepodge of different cultures. And I've been able to see that's the one wonderful thing about living in Hawaii is you see so many different cultures and how they respond to one another and interact with people. I haven't been alienated to just one specific culture. I get to see all of them. And friends, I'm telling you, it's not just a specific culture. It is an epidemic that is permeating culture upon culture to begin to destroy people and wound the soul of each other. And we've got to deal with it as a church. If there's any place that life and hope and love should exist, it should be the church and the families of the church. It should be your house. It should be in your car. Can I get an amen? But you have to make a decision. Just as you intentionally wound someone, you can intentionally build up someone. He goes on to use the word devour, this, the Greek word and the Greek picture we see, the, the word study and the word picture we see in this word devour is to strip one of his goods. To strip one of his goods, to ruin by the infliction of injuries. Listen to this, causing someone to be embittered hmm. wow. by devouring, to utterly consume, to destroy Now, this is something that really stood out to me. It's this. This doesn't mean just to take something of value or of worth from someone. It doesn't mean just to take, it doesn't just mean to take something of value or worth from someone, but also to strip them of all goodness. To cause one to be completely void of anything good. It's not just to step into someone's house and take the goods of their house. It's to render their house useless. Wow. Jesus. There's a big difference between me going in and stealing your, your 70 inch screen TV and setting ablaze your house. See, what Paul is saying is this understanding of devouring is that we devour one another to the point that we render that person useless. We strip them of all the good in their life, everything that is good, everything that is lovely within them. We strip them down and leave them void of goodness. And this is the worst part. We do this, we bite and we devour, but yet we expect goodness to flow from them, but we've stripped them of all goodness. You want your husband to be good, but you've already done the damage in biting and devouring to strip him of all goodness. You want your wife to be good. Oh, somebody, come on, somebody help me here. You want your kids to be good, but because of the biting and the destruction and the damage that has happened in your house, you have stripped them of goodness. They become jaded. 
And Paul deals with this heavily because he understands the repercussions. What are the repercussions of this? He says this, that we become consumed. You know what's, what's profound about this is that word per, per, uh, consumed in the Greek is this, to expend, to consume, to completely and totally use up. To use someone with the intent, now hear this, to use someone with the intent to consume all their resources. That means I'm going to use them for my purposes. I'm going to use them to gain something for me. It's actually not about you at all. It's all about me. So everything you have, it's mine. And I'm not asking for it. I'm taking it. And I'm going to not just strip you of all goodness. I'm not just going to destroy you and bite at you and make you feel useless and impact your identity and make you feel weak. But I'm actually going to use you all up for my own good. That's scary. Now, the reason why Paul deals with this is because this is the condition that the church was in. So he deals strongly with it to say, look, we've got, to, we've got to deal with these things. Our greatest battle is to deal with this, to deal with the biting and the devouring and the consuming within the house. And it's real. And unless we fight, unless we know what it is to battle and to fight godly, we'll continue to be consumed. This morning, I want to challenge you in this. We've been given godly weapons. See, each one of these three, these three things, the biting and the devouring, the consuming, those are weapons of the enemy. Those are, as the Bible says that the devil comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. It is the intent of the enemy to, to strip you void of all goodness, of all usefulness, to render you weak and useless. But God has given us incredible tools. That's right. God has given us incredible tools. Amen. I love this in 2 Corinthians, and you can write this down, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it says this, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to be obedient to Christ. Now, this is what's amazing about that passage. What is it? That there are weapons that are godly. There are weapons that God has given us to fight for our marriage, fight for our family. I said fam, four, four, everybody say four. Fight for your family. And as we walk in this and we begin to apply this to our life, we become powerful. Our godly weapons, let me just list a few. We need love. Come on, somebody. God has given us love, and not just our physical love, not just the love that comes from us, but a godly love, an agape love, straight from his throne, the love like only he loves. I believe that there's a challenge in my own life not to just love my wife to the best of my ability, but to love her with the love of God. That means I depend upon his love to flow through me. Compassion. That's a godly weapon. Do you know why? Compassion changes your heart for someone I'm, I'm convinced of this that when you become jaded and bitter it's so easy to get in a fight you know what i'm saying when you become jaded and bitter it's like they do something ridiculous and it's just like it, it's not even a big deal but automatically it just turns into a fight why because you're angry because you're void of all compassion but what's profound about the component of compassion in our life is that when people are doing things that's ridiculous, people are doing things that just hurt you, and, and even though they're damaging, because of that compassion, you can be like Jesus and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You operate in compassion, say, man, I know you're, you're operating out of a place of hurt and, and dysfunction, and I still love you. If we want to see our families whole, we've got to have compassion in our life. The next time you argue, ask yourselves this question. The next time you get in a fight with somebody at home or at work, ask yourselves this question. Where's compassion in this scenario? Wow. Where is compassion? And if you say, well, pastor, I don't have no compassion, that means there's probably something broken in here that you need to deal with. And that's why the next thing we see is what? Forgiveness. Repentance and forgiveness are weapons and tools that God give us to fight. Yes. Weapons that God gives us to fight. Trust 
and faith. Man, these are godly weapons. Isn't that awesome? Can you imagine if you had trust and faith in your marriage? See, one of the things that the enemy attempts to do is to break trust in a family. So anytime your wife goes out with her friends, you're like, she's out cheating on me. That's broken trust. Well, pastor, you don't understand what she did to me. Um, I, I should be like that because she broke trust. Hold on a second. I understand that their relationships have broken trust. But we need to reformat the constructs of our life and bring trust back in. Because if you can't have trust in a relationship, it will never last. It will never be blessed. How do I do that, Pastor? How do I begin to trust again? You've got to first believe again. You got to begin to hope. Hope and believing begins to turn situations around. Why? Because I can begin to trust again. I believe and I hope that God is doing a miracle in my spouse or in my kids that I can trust them again. But I believe this. If we can bring these components of love and compassion, faith and trust, repentance and forgiveness back in the church, back in our homes, we will become receivers. See, we, we've already become receivers and obtainers of grace. We all know that, right? It's for the grace of God. It's him looking past all our frailties and all of our dysfunctions and releasing his grace to us. And this is what's amazing. When we begin to bring these attributes back into our relationships, what happens? Not only are we a receiver of grace, but we become a releaser of grace. Wow. I want to be a releaser of grace in my relationships. I want to be a releaser of grace in this church. I want to be a releaser of grace in my marriage and with my kids. Why? Because he has given me grace, and so I want to release grace. Just as I have received grace, I release grace. Now, can I tell you, I am convinced of this, that when you have a problem releasing grace, it's because you have a problem receiving it. There's a direct correlation on your ability to release grace based upon your ability to receive it. And most people that are extremely ungracious is because they haven't received the full measure of God's grace in their life. But when you get the revelation of the fullness and the complexity of God's incredible grace, it becomes a whole lot easier to be a releaser of grace. Can I get an amen? Come on, let's try that again. Can I get an amen? Amen. As we begin to see this in our life, as I bring this message to a close, I want you to see these two things. Number one, if we're going to begin to know how to fight godly, we've got to have these godly components in our life. Love, compassion, forgiveness, repentance, faith, and trust and hope. Amen? But we also have to identify the enemy. We've got to have the ability to identify the enemy. I don't know if you guys struggle with this, but there's a lot of times I actually believe my wife was the enemy. Don't look at me with that tone of voice. You know exactly what I'm saying. Lord, she's, she's trying to hinder me. She's restricting me. She's controlling me. And she's become the enemy. And we walk around giving people position in our life and deeming them as the enemy. The enemy of our destiny. The enemy of our promise. The enemy of this marriage. But this is the truth. If we're going to learn how to fight and get breakthrough and victory, we've got to first know how to identify the enemy. Who's the enemy? Come on. See, there's an invisible battle that you're in. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read it quickly. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this dark world, against spiritual hosts and wickedness. Friends, there is an invisible battle. You may not see it. It may not be tangible, but the enemy is trying to attack you. You've got to realize that not everything going wrong in your marriage, everything going wrong in your family is your spouse's fault. The devil wants to destroy you. Right. Now, I'm not somebody that believes there's a demon under every rock, but friends, listen, there is a reality of an invisible war yeah. that we fight Come where on. the devil wants to attack your marriage, yeah. wants to destroy your relationship because your marriage has destiny. That's right. That relationship has purpose. That's it. That's it. 
So you got to know that there's, there's a need to fight the enemy. That's why prayer is essential in your house. That's why having the word of God in your house and living holy is critical for the success of your relationship. Why? Because when you walk in holiness, you close the door to the enemy. Oh, come on, preach it. Another enemy that we need to identify this morning is the mind. Oh, my goodness. There's a mind battle. Anybody with me? In James chapter 4, verse 1, it says this, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and you covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Now, you know what's really interesting about that passage? Is that when you look at the context of that passage, it says you do not have because you do not ask. Do you know what it's dealing with? It's dealing with the spirit of entitlement. That we believe that we are entitled to certain things because of who we are. It, it is a wrong perception of ourselves. That we don't need to go to God anymore. That we don't need to ask God. That there's no need to humble, our, to humble ourselves and approach God anymore. There's no need to talk to people. It's because you owe me anyways. Dealing with entitlement. But friends, hear this because this will change you forever. And it changed me. I'm telling you, I, I got rocked by the Holy Spirit. This week, God began to deal with me in that internal struggle. You know, sometimes my wife is not the issue. It's my perception. It's what's happening on the inside that's the problem. And I, I've got to have that revelation that there's an internal battle. That battle is with myself and my own thinking and my own processing of life and information. That if I'm going to have breakthrough, I've got to first deal with that internal struggle. I've got to get a right mind. That's why the Bible tells us, oh, I love this, to hold what? All thoughts captive. Oh, that's good. Do you know what that means? That means that the devil doesn't have power over you to control your thought life. Wow, come on. Did you know even the demoniac, now hear this because somebody needs to get this revelation. Even the demoniac that came to Jesus, even though he was filled with legions of demons, still had the power in himself to go to Christ. He had the ability to choose to go to Jesus. Don't say, well, pastor, you know, the demons are controlling me. Yeah, you're probably right because you're allowing them to. But there was a moment that we see that you can make a decision to go to Jesus. You can make a decision to say, you know what? I take that thought that my wife is trying, my wife is the enemy or this is a problem or that's a problem. I take that thought captive and I'm going to be victorious over that. That's, right. that's not right. I know I have an internal struggle right now, but I'm going to be victorious in this way. I'm going to win this battle today. Anybody ever have that moment where someone came up to you and they said something and you totally took it wrong? Yeah. Or you said something and they totally took it wrong? Right. Yeah, you know where that comes from? Internal battles. And if we can win that internal battle and begin to filter that through wholeness and healing, we'll begin to win every time. But I like this one too. Can I give you this last one? Identifying your battles is the battle of wills. You know, even Jesus, our Lord and Savior, even Jesus struggled with the battle of wills. The Garden of Gethsemane, as he was preparing to die and go to the cross for our sins, he was there in prayer. And the Bible shows us a picture as, as Jesus was approaching the Father. He said, Lord, let this cup pass for me. He was struggling. He didn't want to go to the cross. He didn't want to go to the cross. But yet he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. One of the greatest battles, one of the greatest fights we'll ever have is a battle of wills. Not my will, but Lord, your will be done. You know, I've, I've got to ask myself this question all the time. I, I have to humble myself and say, Lord, how do I approach this situation? Because in all honesty, I'm, I'm struggling right now. But I want your will for my marriage. I want your will for these relationships. And so that means there has to be a humbling of oneself to say, Lord, I, I, 
I've, I've tried to control this marriage for far too long. Anybody been there before? Trying to control this thing. Trying to get my way out of this thing. How, trying to make it look like I want it to look like instead of going to the word and making sure my marriage mirrors the word of God. Wow. My relationships mirror the word of God. Well, let me close with this. Minister D, if you could come to the piano. We have to first fight godly. Fight with godly weapons. Love, compassion, trust, faith, repentance, forgiveness, and hope. Secondly, we have to identify the fighter. Are we really battling against the devil right now? Or is this an internal struggle that I'm having? Or, or is this a battle of wills? Like, what, what's going on here? But the last thing that I want us all as we just tune in and close here is this. I want you to get this in your spirit. Only the strong will survive. That's the last thing you want to hear on a Father's Day. But did you know that's actually a biblical understanding? Only the strong will survive. What are you talking about? Listen to this. In Luke chapter 11, verse 17, it says this. But he, knowing, we're talking about kingdoms divided. We're talking about the enemy and, and really who's running the show here. He says this. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Now listen to this revelation. Jesus is dealing with these divided kingdoms and this broken system that really functions. It says, look, if, if our house is broken, we're not going to flourish. We're not going to prosper. If my relationships are broken and I'm divided, we're not going to excel in what God has for us. And so he gives this picture. He says, therefore, they will be your judge. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now listen to this. When a strong man fully armored when a strong man fully armored guards his own palace his goods are in peace that word in its context means whole there's wholeness there they're protected but when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils what an incredible picture to understand that we've got to be determined to be strong now this is what i love is that through the power of the holy spirit in our weakness he is he is strong there's a strength that comes straight from the throne of God. But friends, as we close this, this morning, I need you to understand your position. Husbands, wives, children, sons and daughters, listen to me. This is about the health of your family. This is about fighting for your destiny and your purpose and the vision of your house. They're the strong, only the strong will survive. If you feed the dysfunction, the dysfunction will become the strong man in your house. Wow. But if you feed the word of God, if you feed hope, if you feed love, they will become the strong man in your house. You have to take it personally to say, I will guard this home. Come on. It's good. I'm going to be careful of what I allow in this house. That's it. What does it mean to be a strong man? It means this, to be a protector. <laughs> You know what's so awesome about being a protector? Is that you're a watchman. Yes, that's it. That your eyes are fixed to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure I'm looking into this. I'm gonna investigate. How, how is this gonna, if I say this, how is this gonna affect my wife? How is this gonna affect my children? How is this gonna affect my household? You're a watchman. That's good. You carry weapons. Come on, somebody. 
He arm yourself. A protector arms himself. He, he doesn't go to battle. He doesn't watch a house. You know, you, you, you see those security guards. Now, if you're a security guard at the airport, I'm sorry. You, you know, someone said, Pastor, why do we have a, an, an armed police officer outside? Is something wrong? No. It's because I felt like the Lord showed me that we're going to go to another level in excellence. And one of the things that I'm trying to do is making sure that this place is safe for our children. Amen. And that you guys feel protected and valuable. That's the reason we're, we're, we're trying to do this. I, we're we're going to try and be consistent in it. But we want this place to be a safe place. So I'm going to make sure that I have somebody in this house that if somebody comes in to do some damage, can deal with it. Come on. Thank you, Pastor. Oh, come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you dads, you never believed in guns. And then you had a daughter. You know what a strong man does? Not only does he protect, but he provides. Not just financially, but spiritually. Oh, come on. Why? Because he understands his role as a king and a priest of his house. Wow. Come on. See, a protector has discernment. You see the spiritual connotations of something. I'm not going to watch that in my house. That's going to produce something in my house that I don't want here. Wow. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to allow that. You go, of course, I'm going to tell you, your kids are going to get angry. Right. Why can't I sleep with my boyfriend at my parents' house? Because you ain't married, Jack. Come on. And if you're going to be under my roof, because I'm the protector of this house, and I'm also the priest of this house, and whatever happens in this house is going to be holy, yeah. and I'm not going to allow any unholy thing to happen in this house, so you better believe, if you go and do the, you better do it somewhere else. But as far as me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. You better believe I'm not going to allow drugs into my house. I'm not going to allow pornography in my house. I'm not going to allow sexual morality in my house. You better believe. Why? God anointed me as a protector of my house and my relationships and my marriage and my children. I'm a protector. That's good. Thank you, Jesus. That's so good. But lastly, I believe this as we see and understand in this scripture. Only the strong will survive. There must be a unified front. Can we deal with the divisions? Can we deal with the divisions in our house? Those things that bring disunity. Can we deal with that stuff? Because I believe this is that if we leave any cracks within our relationships, the devil's like... <laughs> He's not, he's not just sitting there going, oh, wow, there's been a crack there for a couple weeks. Maybe I'll just take advantage of it. He's waiting. As a matter of fact, he's trying to cause cracks so he can just slip on in. If he can create division in the church, we won't be as powerful as God called us to be. Right, right. That's why a spirit of unity is important in this house. That's why a spirit of unity is important in your marriage, in your relationships. That unified front creates strength. They're godly weapons that he has given us. We need to identify our enemy and deal with our enemy. But we have to realize the necessity to be strong. To not leave our post. To not try and hand our responsibility off to someone else. To guard our house and guard our relationships. I'm not asking you to be manipulative or controlling, but I'm saying this. Will you be that protector? Will you be that priest? Will you be that provider? For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's right. There's a fight, friends. Church, we're going to win the fight.